Hi, good morning. Um, thank you so much for coming to this exciting and unique event. My name is Celia Hoffman and I'm a fourth year in the college studying political science. I'm this year's career development chair for the IOP Student Advisory Board and I'm very excited to be kicking off today's conversation. So Jan Crawford graduated from the University of Chicago Law School in 1993 and it's my honor to welcome her back to campus, albeit virtually. Um, Crawford is the chief legal correspondent for CBS News and an esteemed authority on the Supreme Court. Author of the New York Times bestseller, Supreme Conflict, the inside story of the struggle for the control of the United States Supreme Court. She has been on the front lines covering judicial appointments and confirmation hearings over the last 15 years. Crawford has personally interviewed six current or former Supreme Court justices, including Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Aziz Huck is the Frank and Bernice J. Greenberg Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School and will be moderating, today, moderating today's conversation. An expert in constitutional law and federal courts, Huck came to UChicago Law from the Liberty and National Security Project of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School. As a former law, cl law clerk for the late great Justice Ginsburg herself, he's eminently qualified to analyze the future of the Supreme Court and can offer unique insight into the life and legacy of the justice. We are lucky to get to hear from Ms. Crawford and Professor Huck about the upcoming confirmation hearings, the ideological future of the court, potential ramifications of court packing proposals, and more. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you. Good morning, Dan. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. How are you? Good. Welcome back, virtually, to campus. I know you were here a couple of years ago at the law school, but it's always a delight to have you here. Uh, for those of you who, who have not uh, encountered it, I would strongly urge you to uh, find uh, Jan's book, Supreme Conflict, uh, especially those of you who are uh, going in or thinking of going into either law or journalism. It is an absolutely terrific uh, read, uh, and it, it casts a light on how the individual personalities of uh, justices and the institutional frameworks uh, that uh, I think law professors study often in a very desiccated way uh, interact and produce the, the, the front page stories that we all uh, uh, know. Uh, so I, I strongly recommend you, you go and find that. Um, maybe we can uh, start, Jan, on, on a slightly tangential note, uh, uh, which I know is of interest to some of the students listening, which is, uh, which concerns how you came to uh, the position that you're now in and uh, uh, how you've come to, uh, you know, as, uh, as Celia said, interview and, and, and interact with and be such a central part of the Supreme Court's sphere and uh, the public's uh, perception of it. Well, um, thank you. I mean, first of all, for those really generous words. Um, and I, I want to also extend my condolences to you uh, for the loss of Justice Ginsburg. I mean, obviously it was a tremendous loss for our country, for the court, um, but I know for you personally as well, she was a mentor to you uh, as you the clerk for her and were close to her. And I know that was a loss for her and I've enjoyed reading what you've written about her since. So I encourage all of you guys who are listening uh, to go online if you haven't already and take a look at some of the things Professor Huck has written about his old boss uh, and also what it might mean um, her death for the future of the court uh, if Judge Barrett is confirmed. Um, anyway, um, so I'm really sorry, Professor. But um, as far as uh, my job, I've been a reporter for a really long time, uh, 1993. Wow, that's when I uh, graduated from Chicago. Uh, from, from law school, but I was a reporter before then. I worked at the Chicago Tribune for a couple years and uh, decided that I wanted to do something different because being a journalist, I thought at the time, you kind of have to stand back and chronicle what other people are doing. And it was interesting to me to try to have a more active role in bringing about change. Um, and so I, I was always interested in the law. Um, Obviously, when I got out of law school at the last minute, I decided not to go work at the firm in New York where I'd taken a job, but to go back to the newspaper and cover legal issues. And it was the best decision I've ever made. I love my job. I cannot believe sometimes, don't tell CBS this, but I can't believe that I actually get paid 
uh, to do it. You know, I mean, I, you sit there and you're, you, it's fascinating and, and, and urgent, uh, and I get paid to do that. <laughs> um, so it's obviously not a great time in Washington now, uh, or anywhere in this country or world, frankly. And with this uh, brewing confirmation battle that's going to kick off on Monday, I think we're really going to see these divisions even more. And that's a challenge uh, as a journalist, um, you know, because I try to be obviously uh, completely objective. Uh, but in this environment, it's uh, very difficult uh, to break through. So um, at any rate, uh, I cover the Supreme Court since 19. 94. I started covering the court the year that Justice Breyer joined. So I know that sounds like a really long time ago to you guys. Um, but weirdly enough, on the Supreme Court beat, I'm still kind of young. Uh, we tend to get up there and stay there. So, you know, obviously Nina Totenberg and, you know, you think about some of the, the great um, journalists who covered the court. So it's a great job. Um, I love it. And uh, that's how I get into it. Great. Well, maybe I'll uh, take something you said uh, toward the end there uh, as a cue and ask you if you'd be willing to set the stage for uh, what uh, may occur over the next uh, few weeks or month uh, with respect to a confirmation process. Uh, you mentioned uh, the prospect of hearings on Monday. Uh, maybe it would be helpful for people to hear a little bit about what, what a normal process would look like and what factors uh, you anticipate might, you know, as, as your comments suggest, uh, throw uncertainty into uh, the process? So I don't think there's anything normal about what will happen next week, um, including the fact that it looks as if you're not going to have the kind of spectators that you had in hearings of past. I mean, when we think about how Supreme Court confirmation hearings normally go down, you know, they're in this, in the grand rooms, you know, of the Senate uh, office building. Uh, Kavanaugh's, of course, was interrupted by many hecklers. Um, some of those now are going to have to be kept out because of COVID. So you're going to have hundreds of people showing up outside uh, the Senate office building and the Supreme Court on Monday protesting, trying to get in, arguing that they should be in. It will be uh, quite a scene as this hearing gets underway Monday morning at nine o'clock. Um, and, and just to just so to to give people a sense of how the hearing will play out, the number of uh, uh, senators who are uh, part of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is the body uh, conducting the first uh, hearing on uh, Judge Barrett's confirmation, have tested positive for uh, COVID nineteen. I believe it's it's three at present count. Um, it, will the the hearing be entirely virtual, or will the hearing have a physical component? No, it'll be in person. Um, the hearing will be in person. The two, two of the 12 uh, Republicans on the committee have tested positive for COVID, um, but they should be out of their quarantine period uh, since that now would have been a couple weeks. Um, so, and by all accounts, they're doing okay. Um, that's obviously Senator Lee and Senator Tillis. So it's, they don't have to be there. They can participate virtually, but the nominee will be there and it's, it's going to be in person. Um, but I mean, as you kind of suggested, we know of three, are there going to be other senators? There's a, a numbers problem for the Republicans. Right now, the Republicans have the votes to confirm Judge Barrett and they will confirm Judge Barrett unless, um, you know, there's this numbers problem with uh, COVID. If more senators uh, uh, get the virus, they're unable to be there in person for the vote, which is required when it actually reaches the Senate floor, um, or if there are not enough Republicans for a majority on the committee to get out of committee to go to the Senate. So the, the thing that could really kind of throw this nomination off the rails is the thing that we've been dealing with all year that our world has been dealing with, which is um, the coronavirus. If the senators are healthy and the two Republicans on the committee are able to participate and vote uh, and they have a quorum uh, out of that committee, I, I see no reason yet that she will not be confirmed. Right. So people uh, have a sense of the process that you're describing. The confirmation hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee, 
will end in a vote uh, on the part of the committee. And if the vote is successful, uh, likely it will be along partisan lines. The nomination will proceed <laughs> to the can, floor. Right, <laughs> that's the one thing we can uh, agree on. <laughs> Right, we, can all, right, we can all say right. for sure that's <laughs> right, we can right, be right. confident but right. yeah. Wh whatever happens it will happen along <laughs> partisan lines yes uh, 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 a, a, it, it's like one of those eternal truths that Jane Austen talked about um, um, after the after the after a vote on the nominee in the committee uh, the next step is normally a vote uh, in the Senate as a uh, as a body, right, uh, before the uh, the 100 senators who are present. And uh, if there were a tie, the tie can be broken by the vice president, who's currently uh, Mike Pence. Uh, maybe if we could, if you could say something about uh, whether, whether and, and what your anticipation is of uh, how uh, either that might take place or how uh, unexpected events, uh, and you've already alluded to this, might uh, derail it, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll throw in the, just the additional detail that the, that the third person um, who has tested positive is uh, Senator Johnson of uh, Wisconsin, uh, who I believe is doing fine too. I think all three of them, as far as we know, are, um, you know, but we also don't know uh, about some of the other senators not heard um, who were also at the Rose Garden event. Um, where it's believed that the outbreak may have originated. So essentially, um, I'll, I'll just give you guys a quick rundown on what you can expect next week. This is, some, some things will be very similar than they kind of, there's a real uh, process to this where uh, you'll have opening statements from the senators on Monday, then uh, the judge will be sworn in, then she'll deliver an opening statement. The opening statements from the nominees uh, tend to be really personal, talking about, um, where they came from and what their influences were and what their, you know, so, you know, whether it's a, a Republican nominee or a Democratic nominee, I always really love the opening statements. Uh, and I think it's important because it gives the American people their kind of first introduction to someone who will be deciding potentially issues of enormous importance to all of our lives for a generation. So that is kind of how to get started. Then Tuesday and Wednesday, you'll have some kind of a senator Q and A's, uh, and I find this this sometimes frustrating in covering these hearings because uh, a lot of it is really scripted, and it seems like almost I know that for example when Chief Justice John Roberts went through his confirmation hearings, he, his goal was to really let the senators talk as much as possible, which they like to do. They're not great questioners. I mean, they they're good at kind of a lot of some of them are. But some of them just kind of read what's been written. And, you know, when you've got uh, Elena Kagan or John Roberts or, you know, whoever's sitting opposite them with all that firepower up there, it's, it's not really a fair match sometimes. So, you know, that can be kind of frustrating. Uh, we're going to hear a lot of questions uh, directed to Judge Barrett from the Democrats, obviously, about how she's going to rule on certain cases. What she, Roe versus Wade, is she going to overturn Roe? She's going to say, you know, I've never discussed Roe, I have no, I can't, you know, I have no views. She's going to follow the quote Ginsburg standard where, you know, you don't give any um, kind of insights on cases that might come before you. Um, you're going to hear about the Affordable Care Act, how she would rule on that, guns, affirmative action, like every key social issue. But the very interesting thing I think that we're going to see next week, at least right now, is the strategy from the Democrats, is they are going to focus on the issues. Um, and I think that is great because that's I, the way I wish of these hearings would go down more. Sometimes they get sidetracked and obviously we saw Kavanaugh. Um, I'm not saying those are not important issues, but sometimes personal stuff comes to, to, to the forefront. I don't expect that next week. There are some issues they could bring up about say from the religious group that she was involved in or some other things, but right now, the Democratic senators want their, and the leadership wants the committee members to focus on how she would change the court, they believe, for the worse. Um, so I, I want to pick up on that and, uh, and, 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 and ask uh, uh, and turn the conversation toward the delta between the court with a Ginsburg on it and the court with um, a Coney Barrett on it. 
Um, I do want to put a, a dot on the on the the last stage of the confirmation process, which is the the full Senate vote. Um, is is it your prediction slash expectation, uh, uh, whatever you want to, however you want to describe it, that we are likely to have a confirmation vote before November third, after November third, uh, and what maybe say a little bit about how that uh, vote uh, might physically happen given uh, the pandemic? Yeah, no, I think that I, I think that they're certainly capable of having the vote before the election. I think they would like to have the vote Republicans before the election for it's obviously in their interest, certainly when you look at the latest polls. Um, but uh, I think so yes, I think there could be a vote before the election unless you know four or five of them come down with COVID and can't be there. They have to be there uh, unless they change that somehow, which I don't expect them to do. So to so me, just to like just to pull that out, um, the the present Senate rules require physical presence for voting, and the Senate, uh, although uh, uh, it allows for hearings it conducted in part remotely does not allow for the casting of votes remotely right i just I, that right. was the the, the yeah. point that i wanted to pin yeah. to the student sorry but that, sorry that means that you know while uh, let's say a senator let's say they came down with the virus they could certainly participate in the committee just like we're doing right now you know but if uh, it, when it gets to the senate floor they got to be there to vote and obviously again goes back to the numbers game yeah, uh, yeah. it's a pretty slim a majority of votes that Republicans now have, 53. Right, although notice, or although people should recall that if, if there is a 50-50 tie, uh, a, uh, the vice president can uh, uh, break the tie. Um, uh, notice also, this is, a, this is, this is a, a slight detour into constitutional wonkery. Uh, under the 25th Amendment, uh, if the president is incapacitated and the vice president, uh, by dint of that incapacitation, becomes the president, uh, there is no vice president. The, the vice president. Oh, I didn't think about that. That's the, fascinating. Becomes the president. There was a, the, the, the first time this happened, I think in the 1840s, uh, there was a, whoever it was, I don't remember the, the, um, the particular vice president, uh, there was a debate about whether he was just an acting president and remained the vice president. Uh, but this, whoever, again, I'm blanking on the name, uh, uh, had the practice of, uh, uh, you know, people would send him mail as vice president or acting vice president, and he would just return it all. <laughs> wouldn't even open it. And so it, 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 it stuck that, that once you, if you're elevated, thanks to a presidential uh, incapacitation, you are the president. So uh, anyway, I just thought I would throw that out there. Um, uh, well, that's, that's, that's again something else. I hadn't even thought of that. That's fascinating. And obviously, um, remember seeing Pelosi uh, start the commission to talk about the Twenty Fifth Amendment. <laughs> right, right. I'm sure that was no, nowhere near her, uh, nowhere near her thinking. Um, perhaps we you can. No, it goes to. I, I want to just before we sure, get into sure. how the court will change. Um, you know, there's not. I mean, I've covered judicial confirmations. Uh, since I, the Tribune sent me to Washington, which was in 1994. So it's, it's like the Hatfield and the McCoys. And the process has now gotten, it's, it's you know, so toxic. Um, and it's, you know, it literally, you know, like what goes around comes around with these guys. Um, Democrats will do one thing, the Republicans will one up it. And so, but I do think, and I, this is something I hope you guys will keep in mind. There's not a lot right now that Democrats can do to stop this because, um, as you may recall, the Republicans uh, did away with the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees when Chuck Schumer made the boneheaded decision to filibuster Justice Gorsuch for the Scalia seat, which then gave Republicans and, and McConnell a total gift to walk in and say, fine, we're going to do away with the filibuster. So had Schumer kept his uh, powder dry, uh, he could have at least used the filibuster potentially on the Kennedy seat or certainly now. And most people on the Hill, including McConnell, believe that uh, a lot of the senators, such as Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, never would have gone along with 
the nuclear option to end the filibuster for such critical swing seats or a seat held by Justice Ginsburg. So, but nonetheless, because Schumer decided to filibuster Justice Gorsuch, who was replacing, you know, a conservative icon, uh, now there's not a lot Democrats can do unless Republicans start to defect, which I don't expect. Let's talk about substance, um, uh, not without denying it, uh, or, or undermining the importance of, of the procedural and the dynamic points that you just made. And I think we'll come back to them when we talk about maybe uh, uh, what might happen if there were to be a, a trifecta of democratic control and uh, what, what the Democrats might do in response in that uh, sort of scenario. But let's talk about um, uh, the uh, differences between a court with a Ginsburg and a, a, and a Barrett on it. Um, I, I think many people are aware that uh, Judge Barrett has different views on um, right to life issues or abortion issues, whatever you want to, however you want to label them. Um, she almost certainly has different views on Second Amendment issues and she has a dissent uh, that she wrote uh, while she was on the Seventh Circuit for three years. Uh, on a, uh, a Second Amendment issue where she describes the Second Amendment as, car as capturing a natural right. Um, Which uh, could very well put her to the right of Justice Scalia. On, on right, right. Uh, well, it depends on, depends on the scope of what you think the natural right is. Um, well, certainly I don't think Scalia would have said that felons have a right to gun ownership. Which right, and there's a, the, the footnote yeah. in Heller, in fact, cuts the other way. Um, uh, maybe tell us, Jan, what you are most interested in learning about, either through the hearings or otherwise, about, or, or when she has a chance to make further decisions, about uh, Judge Barrett's views. What, what, where do you think that she is going to uh, move the law either in a predictable way or maybe more interestingly in an unpredictable way? Um, well, Justice, Judge Barrett is, is given uh, some indication of, of how she sees herself uh, comparing herself to Justice Scalia, uh, that she approaches the law very much like a conservative uh, icon. She clerked for him at the Supreme Court, obviously clerk for Judge Larry Silverman on the DC circuit, another, you know, kind of staunch, quote, originalist. Um, so, you know, I think, but, but a lot of justices, conservative nominees like to say, oh, they would see the law like Justice Scalia. John Roberts has said that. And obviously John Roberts uh, has gone, uh, parted ways or seen the law differently than Justice Scalia would have on a number of issues. So, you know, so taking her at his, her word, she sees a lot like Justice Scalia. Well, we can see there what a difference in almost every controversial area of the law that would make um, having someone with those views replacing Justice Ginsburg, um, especially in cases where the court divides, uh, obviously five to four and John Roberts has been willing to provide that key fifth vote to go with the liberals to give them a majority. And he's done that a number of times, uh, starting back with the Affordable Care Act um, and even more recently this term, three different times this term on cases involving key social issues. So, you know, I think the question then we, we kind of, if you look at her, her opinions that she's written on the, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, she's an excellent writer, um, obviously a very sharp thinker, obviously very qualified to be a justice, but uh, if you look at her philosophy, my question is going to be, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this, Professor Huck, is her views on precedent. Um, obviously, the Supreme Court, uh, there's a, 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 how do I want to describe this? I mean, I'm sure most of you guys know about stare decisis. So when uh, a new justice joins the court or the court membership change, they give some respect, some deference to old cases. Um, otherwise, you would just have the court constantly uh, throwing out decisions when new people came on board. So I'm not sure um, whether she's going to be, say, more like Justice Alito and Justice Thomas on stare decisis, or whether she will be more like what we've seen so far of the Chief Justice John Roberts, who has been more willing to kind of 
rein in conservative colleagues, many people believe out of the uh, kind of the institutional integrity of the court. So that's my, I guess, I don't, and, and she's, she's talked a lot about it. She's taken shots at Roberts um, for some of the things that, uh, particularly for how he resolved the Affordable Care Act. Um, that's what I'm going to be interested in next week. And I'm not sure how, you know, we'll know that. And we may not know how she thinks until she gets those cases. When she does, when she is asked to overturn Roe versus Wade, uh, she has said that she thinks that's not going to happen, uh, that it's going to be more abortion restrictions that the court will allow. I think she will allow more abortion restrictions, certainly. Um, but, you know, we won't know maybe until she gets on the court. What about you? What are you most interested in seeing? I, I, I think your prediction is right, Jan, that um, the, the, in, in many areas of the law, the uh, Rehnquist and Roberts Court's response to the, to the more liberal Warren Court that preceded it and to the precedent that were produced by the Warren Court has not been wholesale overruling, uh, but hollowing out. And hollowing out achieves the same um, uh, outcomes as uh, overruling. That's certainly true for Roe v. Wade. Uh, and in the recent uh, abortion-related decision, uh, uh, Juno Medical Services, the, uh, the Chief Justice, although he voted, as you say, to uh, strike down uh, the state laws uh, in that case, uh, nonetheless indicated his openness to the, the hollowing out strategy. Uh, if you were being cynical, uh, I, th I think you would say that particularly uh, for the precedent that really matters, which is Roe or maybe Casey, uh, which are the two leading uh, abortion cases, there are uh, uh, gains to the uh, Republican um, partisan movement, I'm trying to be careful about my words here, um, uh, from not overruling Roe. Roe remains, that is, a, a point of mobilization for the movement, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you, uh, the movement is able to achieve many of its substantive goals through um, hollowing out. I, maybe I would try and rephrase uh, or reframe. I, I just want to say I agree with that, too. And if you remember in the, in the debate, the vice presidential debate, Pence dodged that question. Um, you know, what if the court were to overturn? I mean, it's a useful kind of punching bag, I think, for a lot of Republican presidents and, I mean, uh, politicians. And they can pass these restrictive abortion laws um, and play to their base, but they know that the Supreme Court, at least used to, would have been willing to strike some of those down. So it'll be interesting to see, because the majority of American people do support, obviously, abortion rights to some, to some extent. And, if, and, and uh, you know, it's worth, it's worth noting that, that there, are, there isn't that much of a difference between abortion rates in states with uh, uh, more uh, vigorous restrictions upon uh, access to abortion um, uh, in comparison to states in which there, there are not uh, restrictions. Uh, indeed, there's an argument that Roe itself didn't make that much of a difference uh, to abortion rates. It, it changes the circumstances and in particular the health risks uh, to women uh, of, of how uh, abortions are done. But the, uh, the, the, the rates themselves don't change that much. Uh, and, and, and perhaps the, uh, the, cons the group that is most affected by changes to uh, abortion regulation are, are uh, relatively impoverished uh, women. Right? That, that's whose access is, is really at stake in these cases. Um, Although I'm going to disagree with you slightly on one thing, you know, I do, I mean, I take your point that uh, you don't have to overrule, you, you know, at some point, if you just knock the legs out from under the table, that's all going to fall down anyway. Um, but, yeah. but I can see Judge Barrett, I, I could see this court saying no affirmative action, for example, I, I think Roberts is wanting to end that uh, and has um, for many years, and he's certainly written it. Yeah. Um, and, and yes, there's affirmative action now is a like shell it. of what it once was, but yeah. it has not, this court has not said never. And I could yeah. see Judge Barrett providing the fifth vote for never. Yeah, I, 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 I want to get on to the election and I want to get on in two minutes to court packing, but I, I want to ask you whether you think that that extends to uh, uh, not just affirmative action, but uh, in many areas of both federal and state law, uh, 
uh, victims of discrimination can bring what's called a disparate impact claim. And uh, this allows the plaintiff to prevail on a showing that a policy, let's say that an employer has, uh, has a different and more onerous burden on uh, a minority race. It's usually a minority, right? Um, and um, there's an argument that disparate impact has been an important uh, remedy in the employment context and the housing context, uh, but it's also on shaky ground. I mean, there's, there's a few um, uh, recent opinions in the employment and housing context, again, which have cast some doubt on it. Um, uh, might disparate impact also disappear with a Judge Barrett, I the Justice Barrett? I would say potentially, wouldn't you? I mean, isn't that your analysis as well? I mean, yeah. I just, you know, particularly if there's not been any kind of, you know, evidence of uh, historic past discrimination. I mean, we, you can look at there any number. I think that all race-based cases uh, could be looked at differently now. Let, let's let's talk about something totally uncontroversial, which is the Supreme Court's role in the 2020 uh, uh, presidential election. Um, no, please, we're not going to. Uh, <laughs> I hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> Jan's heartbeat just went up. You can't. <laughs> I'm going to crawl under my desk. Give a little tracker. I'm not supposed to get her heartbeat <laughs> up above a certain one. All right. So, so uh, 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 maybe we should say that that is a that would be a uh, 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 an alarming uh, and uh, difficult to predict set of circumstances. Um, and certainly would uh, cast the, the court in a, uh, a, a more distinctly partisan role than uh, perhaps even Bush v. Gore 20 years ago did. Um, um, well, now let, let's say, let's, let's flash forward and let's, let's say that there is a period, whether it's soon or later, um, in which the Democrats control the House and the Senate and, and the White House. And there's some discussion of uh, what's come to be called packing the court. Now, uh, that term as it's understood uh, in the public sphere, I think means adding seats to the court, uh, which I should note has, has happened and actually happened quite frequently over the first half of the 1800s, right? The court, the number of seats on the court would actually change every uh, couple of decades, uh, sometimes in quite openly partisan ways. Um, do you see, Jan, any uh, prospect of either uh, what I've just colloquially described as court packing, or, and there's another, there's a whole range of other things that, that Congress uh, can do uh, to stymie, limit, channel judicial power. Do you, what, what's your prediction on that front? Do you think that th those things are realistic, or, or does the fact that both uh, Senator Harris and Vice President Biden are, you know, can't stomach an answer to, to that question. Does that, does, does that tell us all we need to know? Yeah, I mean, Biden yesterday said, you'll know, you know, when I, after the election. And I'm like, oh, come on. Uh, so yeah, you could read into that, that there's not going to be a lot of uh, enthusiasm or not. Who knows? I don't know. I mean, they haven't yeah, said. Do you, and, do you think that they're not answering the question because they don't want to say that they're going to do it? Or I do don't you know. I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it's a t maybe it's just such a difficult needle to thread too, because yeah. you know ha the base really wants you know if if Barrett is confirmed, which I think she will be, uh, you know that's going to be six three very conservative Supreme Court. Uh, President Trump will have had three nominations, one of which Democrats believe was stolen. So the base of the party really is going to want another justice or two because they feel it's unfair that the the way this court is going to be, you know, the current makeup of it. So, you know, if they say, no, we're not going to do it, then he's going to alienate part of his base. If he yep. says, yes, we are going to do it, then it's going to be a whole. So, you know, I mean, politically, I guess it is the smartest thing to just say, wait, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Um, but I think that's on the table. I think mm -hmm. what I would prefer to see, which is what has been suggested for many years um, by serious academics, is uh, a serious discussion of term limits. These justices are just too old. You know, I mean, you did, you really don't need justices serving 40 years. I just think an 18 year term limit, which has been seriously considered and written about is something that that should be under serious consideration and discussion. Um, and, you know, justices like John Roberts, before they joined the Supreme Court were very much in support of term limits. 
when they got up to the Supreme Court now, John Roberts is like, yeah, it looks a little different, you know, when you're sitting up there with life tenure. I think that is a way that we could try to um, potentially depoliticize uh, mm -hmm. the court. Let me, let me turn to um, student questions. And I have two questions, I have actually three questions that uh, I, I have been sent uh, separately, which um, the first question I think was, was really addressed by the last uh, point that uh, Jan made. And, and, and so I'm gonna uh, take the moderator's privilege of skipping over that question just so we're not repeating. And then let me, um, uh, paraphrase the second question, if that's okay. Uh, and this is from Alexandra uh, Patsikis. Um, and Alexandra asks about uh, Judge Barrett's affiliation with uh, uh, People of Praise group and how it might uh, 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 play a role in her confirmation hearing. That's a great question. Um, obviously, the Washington Post, New York Times, uh, different outlets have been writing stories about that. Uh, for people, for those of you who don't, had, haven't seen that, people of praise is um, almost like evangelical Catholics. Uh, I don't know how to describe it any differently, but it's a different kind of uh, Catholicism where they kind of live together or support each other. Uh, but it reminds me, I mean, I grew up in Alabama. It, it reminds me of uh, some of the kind of evangelical uh, uh, faiths that, that I grew up with, except as Catholic. Um, and there have been a lot of questions raised about her role in that and were women submissive and subservient to men, what messages were they sending? So that's all been written about. And I expect that you will hear um, some of questions about that. Does that, how will that affect her role? But she is probably going to say, you know, my personal beliefs I will set aside, whether it's on the death penalty or abortion, you know, my, the fact that I'm Catholic or involved in uh, this, this Catholic organization will have no impact on me as a judge, look at what I've done on the Seventh Circuit. Um, the other thing I'll say on that is I'm not sure how much Democrats are going to want to get into that because what happened with Kavanaugh was not the nomination. What rallied the base and cost Democrats four seats was the fight. And that caused Republicans to turn out. And the leadership on the Hill right now on the Democratic side is acutely aware that they don't want to have any kind of moments uh, that might be seen as anti-religious or you know, picking on this woman for her faith uh, that could somehow galvanize the base again. Because right now the polling is showing that this is the Biden, the polling is showing right now that this fight is going to help Biden and turn out for Biden. If all of a sudden Democrats start going after Baird on personal grounds, the concern is that that's going to flip, and the the base of the Republican Party will become engaged. Yeah, I'll, let me let me add two points that which are complementary. The first is that notice that the the, the quasi virtual and uh, 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 less public nature of the hearings is helpful to the Democrats in this perverse way, uh, based upon what what Jan just said. Um, the second uh, observation, which is really not about Judge Barrett or people of praise, but generally, uh, is this, that um, I, I, I think it is easy to underestimate how important people's life experience is in how they approach cases, not because of the judicial philosophy that they adopt, but because of who among the litigants and actors in a case they are capable of hearing. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll put in a little uh, plug for my former boss here, uh, who, I, I, you know, is not, I, I'm, you know, Jan, you met her. Um, I, I don't think anyone would call her a kind of people person. Um, 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 like in, in, like inter, in, in her interactions, but she had a remarkable uh, talent and willingness to perceive and think about the positions and the, and the, day-to-day -day life of, of the people who were in the case uh, before her. And at least in my experience, I, I saw her trying to do that for all of the people on all sides uh, of the case. Um, and, and I, you know, I can see this in um, uh, uh, later opinions, not in the year that I clerked, cases like the Christian Legal Society uh, case uh, is a nice example of that. Um, and, and, and I think that this capacity for empathy and the selectivity of empathy is um, is necessarily driven by people's life experience. 
Um, and it plays into cases, not in terms of, you know, are you an originalist, are you a living constitutionalist, or what have you, a textualist, what have you. I, I'm not sure those labels actually matter all that much, much as we law professors like to babble on about them. Um, uh, but, you know, who you can understand, who you can listen to, matters a great deal. Um, let me, I'm sorry, I, I hijacked that. Let me, no, let me I mean, that's an excellent point, and it goes to a point, I, I know you've written about this, that if you think about the current membership of the court now, you know, it's, it's uh, former judges, a prosecutor, uh, just there's really no one with her life experience that's going to be on the court that, you know, actually was involved in representing people and helping people uh, trying to affect change as an advocate as she did. I think we have one minute and let me, let me maybe ask a last question and then give it to you, Jan, to have the last word too. Uh, and the question uh, is from Eliza Beckham and Lee, uh, and it's, um, what happens if Biden were to win and she has not been confirmed? Um, and I think the question is, can a, can a nomination be withdrawn by a subsequent president? Well, wouldn't the Senate just try to confirm her? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think that's what they would try, McConnell might try to do, or maybe not. Um, so, I mean, because Trump will still be the president, until January. Uh, when does the Senate turn over? That's another question. When does the Senate end? That, that's the, another uh, I think the Senate, the Senate continues to be January, although there is this Arizona debate. special election in which uh, Mark Kelly can be seated at the end of November, I think, as the one person who might change over. Um, you know, I think we are at the end of our time, and um, I want to, you know, uh, you know, Jan has one of the busiest jobs in the United States at this moment, for the next few weeks at least. And we need to be mindful of her, her time and she's been enormously generous coming and speaking to us. So let me thank you so much, Jan, for, for your insights and your contributions and for your, uh, the role you play in our public culture, which is um, tremendously important to our democracy. And I'm, I'm immensely personally uh, and institutionally grateful for, for what you do. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Thank you so much for saying that. And I really enjoyed being here and talking with you. I wish we could keep going. I feel like we barely even scratched the surface, but I really appreciate it. And the Institute of Politics, thank you. And University of Chicago. I mean, I love my job and the reason I get to do it is part of the foundation that I got at the law school. Um, and so I'm so grateful. I'm always available to come talk to you guys. Thank you all so much.